Gary, I guess maybe 95, 96 was the first time with you. Yep. About that. A current member of the Illinois Higher Education Finance Study Commission, Dr. Gary Davis, holds the Community College Advocacy Award from the Association of Community College Trustees. Before his retirement from the Illinois Community College Trustee Association in 2005, Gary taught religion and philosophy in the five American universities and in Ireland and Canada. Today, Gary is an adjunct faculty member at the University of Illinois and Benedictine University where he advises doctoral students in higher education. He maintains an active consulting practice with public and private boards. His publications on ethics, leadership, appear in over 30 books and journals, and he is a frequent contributor to Inside Higher Education. Fellow colleagues, let's meet and greet Dr. Gary Davis. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a delight to be back in, in New Jersey. I told Ron that any uh, trip to New Jersey is always a good one for me. Uh, the last time I met with this group, uh, Marsha reminded me, was in Trenton uh, about five years ago, I think, or so. And uh, my presentation kind of blew up because in the middle of the presentation, uh, the room was invaded by most of the, I think, the New Jersey legislature. They just poured into the room or putting their arms around you guys, and I was saying, well, I don't need me, you know, <laughs> everything's good in New Jersey. And, and, and Larry was very apologetic afterwards, and I said, Larry, if you'd been in Illinois, and this had happened in reverse, you would have said, Gary's doing great stuff, because look, these legislators love him, and they love the trustees, and they love the presidents. And that's what I saw in, in Trenton. Uh, testimony to uh, your leadership, like uh, Ron Winters and, and, and Larry uh, Nespoli who has done a magnificent job and is the, probably the dean of the, of the state associations that represent community colleges around, uh, around the uh, United States these days. So you're very, very fortunate to have the, the, the leadership that you have in the council. And uh, also, you're very fortunate to have the presidents working for you that were uh, the center of the previous discussion. Uh, for a part of my life, I, I, well, I actually was headed for, I thought, the college presidency. Um, I, was, I started out as a faculty member, and I, I noticed there were some things that weren't working right, so I tracked it down, and I found that the culprit was the department chair. So I became the department chair, and I still had problems. So I figured the problems really were with the dean, and so I became a dean, and sure enough, I still had problems. So uh, th then I was convinced the problem was with the college president, and the only solution was to become a college president. So I, I worked for three years as the assistant to the president of uh, Saginaw Valley State College in, in Michigan, the newest state university up there. And um, I, I basically lived with the guy. I mean, I drove his car. Uh, those of you who have done this sort of thing know what this is like. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a job, right? <laughs> uh, and. <laughs> And the more I watched Jack Ryder, that was his name, he's retired now down in North Carolina, very happy man, retired. Uh, he, uh, the, more, the more I watched Jack, the more I said to myself, I'm not sure I'm cut out for this, you know. This is a really rough lifestyle. They, the college presidents invented the phrase 24-7, you ever heard that, you know. There's never, you're never off duty. Really, you aren't. Things happen uh, middle of the night. What, what, our offices burned down one night. I got, a call, I, I, I got a call at 4 in the morning from the vice president for finance. And his name was Jerry Woodcock. And he said, and, and we used to laugh about the vice president for academic affairs who had, had, a, had a yak in his office, a big woolly yak. Uh, and, and it had been brought back to him by an anthropology professor who had been in Tibet or something. And he found this stuffed yak and he had it shipped back to the vice president, kind of as a joke, and, and, and told the vice president he had to put this in some prominent place in the university. So the, 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 the VP, never to be one up, said, OK, I know just the place, my office. It's going to stay right here. So it was. You walked into Bob Yen's office and there was this big woolly a yak there, and anyway, Jerry said, you know Bob Yen's yak, Gary? And I said, yeah, it's four in the morning. 
And I, he, he says, well, he doesn't have it anymore. <laughs> and, I, and I said, oh my gosh, somebody stole Bob's yak? And he said, no, it burned up. So did Bob's office, and so did your office. Uh, and, and then the president and I went out and sifted through the ashes to see if we could find out what had caused the fire and what we were going to do next. We went through stuff like that almost on a weekly basis. Maybe not always that dramatic, but it was always stressful. And, and you got people, very smart, bright people in the room right here today who are college presidents who could be making a lot more money and living a lot more relaxed lifestyle, doing something else. And the only reason that they're college presidents is because they feel a call to that profession. They feel a call to academic leadership. And I think all trustees uh, share uh, my feelings in saying we owe those people, those college presidents, a big debt of support. <laughs> gratitude. And then, and then let me tell you something about what does relieve the stress of a college president, and that's a good board. I mean, if there's, uh, see all these noddings that are going on in the room? These are college presidents who are nodding right now. If you've got a, uh, a board that gets it, the way uh, I could tell the trustees in the room are getting it uh, after, uh, at the end of the, the preceding uh, presentation, asking the right questions, the big questions, the 35,000 foot questions, the future oriented questions, those are the kinds of, of trustees a president prays for and once in a while actually gets on a board and then when they develop that experience and that leadership team at the board level, the president feels a lot more secure in making courageous decisions uh, that involve change. You know, when nobody likes change, uh, uh, there's all kinds of stories about that, that the only kind of people who like change are meter, mater, uh, meter uh, maids and the babies, right? I've got a, a granddaughter who's six months old. Let me tell you, she likes change. Uh, and, and, and meter maids like change too, but most of us feel a little nervous when things start to change. Oh, I don't know how to do this. And you never get over it. I mean, I, I, I teach online now, and they're, they're always changing things on me. I, I use the angel system and the blackboard system. It drives me nuts. Today I can't even, I found out I can't even enter a grade for, for a student who's just finished the paper because they've changed the way I'm, I'm supposed to enter grades. And I don't, I don't know what the new way is. And I have to now go to my department chair and plead ignorance. So talk about uh, a come down for somebody like me. I have, I have to actually send an email to my department chair say I can't figure out how to enter the grades. But it, it, right, this stuff goes on all the time in academe. And, and in the world, and, and, and in order to, to uh, uh, embrace change and to do it courageously, if a president's going to do that, he needs the backing of a strong board. That's the end of my presentation. See you later after dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that, really, that really is what I'm going to try to get across today. Uh, I, I thank uh, Larry and Ron for inviting me, uh, Dr. Messina for providing this uh, fine facility. Uh, I, I think that this is, the, this is a good example of a, a a living example of a forward-looking uh, college, a college that has actually met the needs of its community and at the same time reduced uh, the, uh, the, the burden, as he said, on the taxpayers. That's exactly what people want. Um, it's too bad that, 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 that all of our decisions aren't, aren't quick and easy in academe. They aren't. Uh, a lot of times we're in, in turbulent times. I'm teaching right now, as uh, Ron mentioned, in a graduate program. I ask my doctoral students all the time, wh wh what possessed you to study to go into academic administration at a time uh, so turbulent as, th as this? And, and they, they, they always come back at me with the same observation, that, that from what they've seen, uh, people learn faster in turbulent situations than they do in calm situations. Or as one of them, who's a sailor, uh, put it to me, you don't learn anything when you're sailing or learning how to sail if you're in calm water all the time. Sometimes you have to go out in the rough water and try a few things out to see whether or not they actually work the way they're described in the textbook and whether or not you can apply them. And they feel that this is just exactly the right time to be academic leaders. I think that's probably true, but to be able to seize the day, to seize the challenge that's before us, is it means we have to overcome our, all of the emotional side of our brains that are saying, uh, run for the hills, you know, uh, assume the fetal position, uh, crawl up in a ball and maybe it'll blow over. Uh, the, 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 there's some of that going on in, in our faculty, there's some of it going on in our administration, there's some of it going on in, in some of the most loyal supporters of the college, and the president has to resist that, and the way to resist it is to use uh, the board 
as a, as a sounding board and then as a, a, a backboard, some, some, some group of respected leaders who are going to go out to the community and say, the president knows what he's doing. We've had serious conversations with him or with her, and we're confident that she can bring the, the ship into the harbor. Uh, what you're doing today is part of that process. In order to prepare people for those uh, uh, critical situations where they'll have to uh, face their, their tormentors and their severest critics, ha they have to practice leadership, and that's what you're doing right now. Uh, just as when you learn to fly a, a plane for the military, you learn in a, uh, what do they call those things? Uh, simulators. simulators, right. Uh, and that's kind of what we're doing today. We're, we're kind of uh, trying some questions out, some answers out to see whether or not they work. We're in a relatively safe environment. We can learn, you can learn something about trusteeship. And, and the fact that the council has provided you with that opportunity, I think, is a testimony to the council's value. A lot of times people at the college will ask, well, why do we belong to so many different groups and associations? If the issue is ever the council of county colleges, the answer is because it trains leaders. And those leaders will be dependent upon in critical moments of the college's existence. And then you can roll out some examples like New Jersey Stars, right? Ron said that that wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the fact that you had taken time to prepare people with uh, the, 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 the notion that that program was needed. And then the, the scholars program, what's it called, Larry, where you've got the, the doctoral program in New Jersey now? Rowan program, right, uh, where, where, where uh, you've got people standing up today, right? About half the room stood up when the question was asked, who's got some, who has been uh, involved in that program in one way or another? That, that, that didn't just happen, if I'm right about that. The council had something to do with that, right? So you've got people at the council who are preparing leaders. One of the best forms of leadership is to make space for people to be creative and give them safe space. The highest form of leadership is that of an, uh, enabling others uh, to lead. I think that's true, and that's what you're doing today. So you can all just pat yourself on the back for doing the right thing at the right time, a very critical time. Uh, well, here's the plan for this afternoon. I, I'm, I've taught long enough to know, and this is especially true with people in their 20s, let me tell you, uh, that you don't uh, teach them much by standing up in front of them and talking to them. You've got to get them working in work groups. So you're all at ta that's why the tables are organized the way they are. There, there's a question in everybody's table, at everybody's table, should be on a, on a yellow post-it note, right in the middle of the table. So we're going to use those questions to get a conversation going here in a few minutes. What I'd like to do, what I propose to do, is to use our time to, um, first of all, ask you what you're thinking about, what questions are you raising, and then we'll structure the discussion around that, and, and also, in passing, make some observations about some of the uh, the changes that I've seen uh, uh, regarding uh, the people who are serving as community college trustees uh, around the country and uh, also as community college presidents. So I want to talk about some of the changes there too. Because the presidents and the trustees really form a team and it's like a, a, a double play combination in baseball. You can't really talk about how a shortstop performs a double play without talking about how the second baseman performs a double play, right? It's the Ginger Rogers Fred Astaire uh, routine. I can use that with this group. When I used it with my graduate students last week, one of them said, who is Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire? We've never heard of them. Uh, but maybe some of you will remember who they were. Ginger Rogers was a good dancer, but she couldn't have done it without Fred Astaire leading. And uh, the opposite is true, too. Fred was a pretty good dancer, but Ginger did the same steps, only in high heels and backwards, right? Which made her probably even the better dancer of the two. But they mostly were a team, right? They were a team. And, and that's what, uh, what, what we have to think of the, uh, of the uh, uh, president and the board as. Now, that doesn't mean that they always have to agree with each other. Uh, they don't. Uh, so, uh, the best teams are the ones that are open to uh, self-criticism and criticism of the other person. And the other person doesn't take offense to that because he knows that his partner is only trying to make him better. Any of you who have ever played doubles in tennis know that, right? You, you, your partner doesn't get after you unless he really wants to win or she really wants to win. And she's, so by helping you play better, understand your role, then uh, you're, you're going to make her or him more successful in the win-loss column. And that's really what it's all about. Learning to trust each other, rely on each other, that's what presidents and trustees do. Working together, we're going to try to uh, identify some of the, 
the, uh, the skills set that make up a successful board uh, in these turbulent times.